Hello. It works. So, hi, I'm Dave Woodhouse from Amazon, working on mitigating Spectre and Meltdown, and now L1TF, um, largely focused on Amazon's EC2 fleet, which um, means I've had a very fun year. Um, Paolo has talked about the hardware and the underlying problem and, and how this came about. I'm going to go into a little more detail of how we actually try and deal with this in software. Um, so I'm going to start by sort of classifying what it, may, you know, what it takes to at make a speculative attack, the various classes of problem, how we get into speculative ex execution and continue it and get the information out. I'm going to talk in more detail about Spectre and Meltdown and the mitigations we have for them um, and the new L1 terminal fault that was published last month. So to start with, for a speculative attack, First, we have to get into speculative execution. We have to have a mispredicted branch or something so that instructions are executing that are eventually going to be torn down. And the principle, between, the principle behind speculative execution was always that it doesn't matter. It's going to be torn down before it ever gets committed, so we can do what we like here. And that's why Intel, but not AMD, had this problem with Meltdown, where we don't even need to bother checking the permissions on the memory access because it's never going to happen. Um, um, so we start with getting into speculative execution, which is really easy. Um, you can have a mispredicted conditional branch at the end of a loop. You can have indirect branches, which it learns is going to somewhere else, and then you make it go somewhere other than where it's expected. You can have exceptions. Um, again, memory accesses that fault, but we can continue executing after them until we realize. And actually, modern Intel CPUs make it really easy with TSX. We have the transactional extensions, which effectively work as speculative execution. And you can run as much as you like, well, within reason, and eventually commit to the transaction. And you can just basically, instead of having to do any of these tricks with deliberately mispredicting, you can just say, oh, yeah, please run this speculatively. It's really easy. So most of the exploits just use TSX, because that's nice and easy. So that's the first part, is get into this special witch space mode of speculative execution. Um, and then you want to prolong it for as long as possible to run as many instructions as you can. And you can do that with cache misses, which will take hundreds of cycles to resolve, and dependent loads with arithmetic, depending on previous arithmetic, um, and things like that. So you can, you can basically get into speculative execution mode and you can stay there for quite a long time and access the data you need, do whatever it is you need to do. And then you need to leak the information. Um, and everybody's doing this with the data cache by, um, I've got a secret in a register and then I load from some address calculated from that secret and then I later observe the effects on the cache to see which cache line was touched. Um, and you can even do this when it's cache lines that you can't see. So if you're persuading the kernel to load from some kernel address based on a secret, you can't directly access that same address, that's kind of the point, and see how fast it is. But what you can do is load other user space addresses into the cache, fill up all the lines of the cache, all the ways of that cache line, with user space addresses, and if the kernel accesses something that lands on the same line, and the same index, then it will evict one of your addresses. So you don't even need to be able to access the same addresses to make the inference through the data cache, to leak that information out of speculation. But there are other theoretical ways that information can leak from speculation. There's instruction cache. If you make it to do a branch speculatively, and um, you can see you could potentially infer from the instruction cache afterwards. And likewise, you can even make inferences from the state of the branch target buffers and various other things in the TLB. You can, there are many things that basically disprove the initial um, hypothesis that all this speculative execution when it's torn down, it never really happened. The, it, the data cache is just one of quite a few things that, um, that really can let you leak information from speculation. So, so let's look at Meltdown, which was originally variant, called Variant 3 of the, the Spectre set of um, 
problems. So Paolo talked about this a little bit. Basically, when you're in speculation um, on an Intel CPU, it just doesn't bother to check whether you're allowed to access that data. So as long as you've got into speculation, you can just access anything you like in kernel memory, and you can't read that data directly. You can't see the contents of the register that failed, but what you can do is offset, you load from some data, some address, offset by that value, and then make inferences from the cache later. So, I believe this occurs on power as well, and there is at least one ARM CPU which suffers it, but um, mostly we, um, we've been dealing with this on Intel. Um, and this one runs entirely in user space. There's nothing the kernel sees about this. There isn't a, necessarily an actual fault, um, because you could even have the initial memory access happening in when you're already in speculative execution. So if you were to do the access, which is bound to fault as your first thing without being in speculation first, and then yes, the pipeline would continue to do the dereference and you'd get a little window there when you could leak, and the, but you would take a seg fault and the kernel would notice that. And we might be able to do mitigations based on that. But that isn't necessarily, you don't even have to take the fault because if you're already in speculation, then that fault isn't gonna happen because it's going to be torn down beforehand. Um, so then we get to the interesting part. So, so um, Spectre variant two is indirect branches. So we have the branch target buffer which predicts where a given branch is going to go. Um, now this, you need to find a gadget within the kernel. You can't mostly on modern CPUs trick it into just running your own code to do what you like in the in your user space. You need to find a gadget in the kernel which is going to do the thing that you want. And um, it's not good enough just to load memory into a register. So that example that Paolo gave earlier with the FD table and F control, that will load um, data into cache at some offset from FD table, but you can't get that. And you can learn where FD table is maybe um, but you, you couldn't learn anything from that example, right? In fact, a, a full Spectre variant to gadget you have to find in the kernel, it has to first load a secret, and it can be targeted by that, but then it has to do another load at an, you know, with an offset from that. You, so using the secret it's loaded as an offset. Right, so it needs to be a second array load using the, the secret that you've tricked it into loading. Um, and those are relatively rare, um, thankfully. Um, but they do, it does require gadgets in the kernel. Um, likewise, Spectre 1 conditional branches, you have to have, but, but we do have those in loops. Um, because effectively you're always going to go around the loop an extra time. You're always going to do one access off the end of the loop. Um, and if you're going to if the loop is doing that thing and then loading an offset based on what, what it's found off the end of the loop, you can trick it. Um, and attackers are very good at dealing with um, memory allocation patterns and deliberately ensuring that a certain data structure is allocated right before the data structure with a secret that they want to get. Um, and so you can arrange to read to at least the beginning of some other data structures just by very careful allocation patterns. Um, so yes, as Paolo said, for Meltdown, we have a simple but slow option. Basically, we take all those page tables out of the kernel memory map. So when user space is running, we actually flip the page tables so that the only kernel pages that exist are a tiny trampoline and all it can do is flip the rest of the page tables back so that the kernel code is present. So there are a few pages just enough to handle interrupts and to handle syscalls, and they will flip the kernel text back again so that you can see it. Um, and that effectively prevents um, the meltdown attack, but it's slow. Um, and in backports to earlier kernels, we have at least started using um, address space IDs, the PCI ID, um, so that instead of having to do a full TLB flush on, on this context switch, 
At least we don't have to do that, and it's slightly less slow than it was, but it's still yeah, something like 30%, even with, even with that. Um, but it's simple as that. We have to do it, or we have to accept that user space can just read anything that it wants. Um, so for Spectre v2, this is the indirect branch prediction. Um, one of the simple things we can do um, is make it harder for user space to pollute the branch predictor. So yes, they have to find a gadget, um, but we, also, we can also make it hard for them to actually point it at the gadget. So essentially, the fix in hardware is to tag the branch target buffer, as, um, as Paolo said, right? So you tag it with the ring, the privilege ring that the branch target was learned in, and you don't use it in a more privileged ring. Um, and in the meantime, though, Intel managed to give us some microcode updates, even for current CPUs, which give us a way to do that with um, MSR writes. So as we enter the kernel, we don't do this in Linux. Um, Linux threw his toys out of the pram a little bit, and rightly so. Um, but the principle bit behind the MSRs is that as you enter the kernel, you write this bit to the um, branch restricted speculation. And this has a fairly complex definition, but basically says that any branch target learned in a less privileged mode will not be used in a more privileged mode after this barrier bit is set. So you do have to do it every time. It's not just set and forget it because it, the hardware can't do the tagging properly and keep track. So essentially, as you set this bit, which is quite slow, then it goes and evicts the cache of, of, le of anything learned in less privileged modes. Um, and that only covers privileged modes. It doesn't cover the case of context switching between one process and another. And the kernel's kind of supposed to stop processes from reading each other's data as well. Some people like that. Um, so we have this other MSR which basically gives you a big hammer and it flushes the entire um, branch target buffer. Um, now Linux doesn't use this much either. It can do it on context switch, but currently we only do it on context switch to a non-dumpable process, a, a process that, that won't dump core. Um, and we are debating still whether we're going to expand that to other things and um, perhaps do it when we context switch to a process that couldn't p-trace the previous process or it's complicated and it's expensive so so far it, it's we've got a partial mitigation but the IBRS is painful because it has to be set on every entry to the kernel and it's very expensive um, so we have a different approach um, which was which came out of Google in in the beginning and instead of just jumping to contents of a register which is going to be predicted. Basically, we fool the branch predictor. Um, so what we do is call, um, we, we do a call and a return, but before the return, we overwrite the return address on the stack. So instead of jumping to this address, which is in R11 here, we call just a few instructions later, overwrite the top of the stack, and then return to it. Um, but um, the CPU is going to predict that return goes just to just after the call instruction because that's what returns do normally, right? So we're abusing the, um, the return predictor and that's basically going to capture speculative ex execution. It just goes into an endless loop there. Um, so the instructions that are running speculatively just go into an endless loop. And then, yes, we get a pipeline stall and we end up going to where we wanted to go. But the CPU cannot be tricked into going to a gadget and leaking information to user space um, and doing what user space wants. So this means that any indirect branch, any time you follow a function pointer, gives you a massive pipeline stall. And uh, we've had at least two people complaining about this this week. Right? <laughs> Um, and there are a bunch of cases where we've had to then follow up and deal with the, um, the performance fallout of Red Pauline. So that was for a simple branch jumping to something. Um, 
but it's slightly more complicated to do it for a call because you essentially have to do the same trick in the middle, which I've made smaller, but you have to do so with your actual return address for the code at the end that will continue on the stack when you jump to where are 11 points. So you wrap it with another jump to the end and jump back and then do the, the repolene. So it ends up looking fairly complicated, but ultimately that is just a call. And so we have alternatives in the kernel which will just turn calls into repolene calls. Um, and we have little thunks that you can just load the address you want to go to into a register and, and jump to it. Um, so we've done this um, for Linux and for Zen. Um, and this basically protects us from the indirect branch prediction. So we don't have to use the um, IBRS MSRs to protect the kernel against, um, against Spectre v2 because we build with Repolin. Um, so yes, it has something of a performance impact um, because it always causes a prediction miss and a pipeline stall. So one of the things we were talking about was it yesterday, was you can make a simple direct call. If, if there is a, a function which is almost always going to point to the same place, but sometimes it's different, for example, the DMA ops, um, you can just say, if the function is this Intel IO MMU one, then call it, or if it's the generic no IO MMU one, then call it directly with no pipeline stall, else do the indirect call, um, and even in C code, we've, we've fixed the C compiler so that it emits Repolin calls um, for, for, direct, for indirect calls as well. Um, so this is one of the ways we can get our performance back. And even for cases where it is not known at build time what the generic function is going to be, that what the comment case is going to be, we can still use alternatives, runtime patching of the kernel at boot time, so that when we learn that we have booted on an AMD system with an IOMMU and it has these IOMMU functions, we can actually fix that generic function and fix the direct call to it at boot time so that still we get the, um, the best performance in the common case, even, at, even when that changes at runtime. Um, there are other cases where um, we have functions which iterate over, for example, every page in a page table, every object in an array, and you can pass them a function pointer to call back this function for every element. And those started to suck quite a lot as well. Um, but the, some of those are really easy to fix by just inlining the iterator function. So instead of actually having an indirect call within a C function, which is passed a, point, a function pointer as an argument, it gets inlined, and of course, then the compiler can see what function it's being called with, and it can be emitted as a direct call. And so there were some cases in the MM code, uh, I think this was one of the first Repolin performance fixes that went in, which just got an order of magnitude slower until we simply added an inline. Um, and that helps. There are still some cases we need to fix. We've talked about DMA, DMA ops this week. We haven't done any proper tracing yet of exactly where the pain is. We should do that, and we should have some stats on how many repoline calls we are making to which functions. I think we might be quite surprised by how much performance we can get back from that. But ultimately, the performance of repoline, even as it is without too many mitigations, is so much better than IBRS because just setting that IBRS bit already has to predict, uh, protect against branch targets learned by the hyperthread sibling. Um, hyperthreads essentially are just the insane case of the multi-threading where it's all using the same execution units, it's all running on the same core, it's just that it's fetching instructions from two different places at the same time, pretending to be two different CPUs, when in fact it's just one. So the branch targets are shared, the level one cache is shared, everything is shared. Um, and just turning on the IBRS bit has to protect, protect against branch targets learned in the sibling as well. Um, so Repolin, even with its existing problems, is still much nicer than using the MSRs. Sorry? 
We need, we need to fix the tracing. We need to get, uh, but you've just fixed it so we can trace ASM functions, right? No, 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 I'm saying that the trace points do more Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, that too. <laughs> so, the other thing we haven't mentioned yet is the return stack buffer. Um, apart from briefly, I, I talked about um, how the retpoline will abuse the fact that we know, we, we know where we're going to return to. Now, CPUs, in, as well as the branch target buffer for indirect branches, they have a return stack. They know this next ret is likely to go to this address um, because that's kind of an obvious prediction, right? You, you just remember where the last call instruction was. Um, now, older CPUs, they just loop. Um, and if you deplete the RSB, which you can do by context switching, right? So if, you, if you're in a shallow call stack and you context switch into another process, which you change the stack and you're in a deep call stack, you can effectively, as far as the CPU is concerned, you are returning more times than you've called. Um, and you underflow the RSB. Now, older CPUs didn't have much of a problem with this. They just loop, I believe, or I can't remember, or just saw. Either way, it wasn't problematic. From Skylake onwards, they start to take predictions from the branch target buffer, which is problematic because the replicate approach is that, well, we're not going to have any of those nasty indirect branches in our kernel, so we don't care about the branch target buffer and the fact that um, user space can pollute it except we're not going to build a kernel without the ret instruction. That would be hard. Now, we have experimented with nasty tricks for essentially a trampoline on ret, where we deliberately ensure that there is something in the um, branch target, in the RSB. We deliberately do essentially call the next instruction, then adjust the stack pointer, and then do the ret which is also going to cause a pipeline cell on every return instead of just on indirect branches. That didn't really perform very well, but worked. Um, but, um, yeah, the only correct fix on Skylake is to use IBRS as Intel intended it. Um, but Linux doesn't like IBRS as Intel intended it, and so, yeah, we don't really have a fix for Skylake at the moment. The, um, um, so Spectre v1, this is the one with conditional branches. Um, and effectively, we need to fix the gadgets where the kernel can be tricked into doing this, this full gadget of you know, loading from, in this case, the array variable. No, even that isn't a full gadget, is it? That, that's the same as the FT table example. You, you still need to load with you know, using val as an offset into something. But, um, so the problem here is that if index is smaller than size, branch can be mispredicted. You'll always go around in another time, or it can be, you know, maybe it's just an error, a bounce check, which is always going to be predicted as okay. Um, and so you'll always do that dereference. Um, so the array index no spec macro has some nasty tricks to basically round up size to the next power of two and subtract one from it and then and the index with that value. So it is basically an enforced arithmetic bounds check. And so it doesn't matter that the branch is mispredicted as not taken or as, as allowing this code in the, this section to, to run, it still won't actually load memory from at least not from too far outside the array. If you have an array that is not actually a power of two in size, then yes, you can still load a little bit off the end of it. It's not perfect, but at least it means these gadgets can't be used to just access arbitrary memory anywhere in the kernel by giving them a completely bogus index. And in you know, Paolo's example, a completely bogus file descriptor. Will. You think it works for any size, not just the power of two, but it works by masking. It's really, really clever. It's really, really clever. <laughs> okay, I. Fair enough. Uh, Paolo, I've got a microphone now. So the only problematic case is when the array is actually not there at all, and then you can access the zeroth uh, index. Okay. 
I mean, it's not really that problematic. So yeah, we have similar masking in, in get user for accessing user space, and we have static analysis. Coverity will highlight these gadgets, and we, we can go and fix them. Um, so then last month, it got slightly more interesting. Um, so within a VM guest, we have normal page tables, um, which translate a process address, a virtual address, into a guest physical address. And then the CPU has the extended page tables, which, um, which translate from a guest physical address to a host physical address, right? So there's two levels of translation. First, purely within the VM guest, coming up with a guest physical address for a given page, which may or may not exist, right? The virtual address might be marked as not present. And then, once you've got a guest physical address, you actually have to translate it to a host physical address on the real machine for which pages that particular VM owns. So, when running in speculative execution, if a page table is marked not present, if something accesses a page that is not there, it's going to fault, the CPU takes the physical address that's in that page table entry, the guest physical address, except it's invalid, right? The kernel can use those bits for whatever it likes as long as the present bit is not set. And we use it for you know, stuff like the offset into the swap file for pages which have been swapped out and things like that. We, we can use those bits in software for whatever we like. The CPU takes that address, guest physical address, interpret it as a host physical address, completely bypassing the EPT and the translation that virtualization is going to give you, and lets you have that data. As long as it's in the L1 cache, so effectively, a VM guest can arbitrarily read any physical memory in the host as long as the host has it in its, as long as this CPU core has it in, in its L1 cache, which is a little bit sad. Um, so yeah, basically, and because of hyperthreading and L1 cache being shared, you can read any data that your sibling is touching. So those gadgets that we talked about, that the Spectre V1 gadgets have to load an address into memory, but you can't have that. There's a load of value into memory, but you can't have that. You actually have to find a gadget which will leak it by loading some other pointer offset. Yeah, screw that. that. Your example was fine. My example was fine. All you have to do is load it. It's fine. And then your sibling can just read it. No problem. Um, so, what can we do about this, other than taking up goat farming? Um, firstly, you can flush the L1 cache on every time you go back into a guest, which is fine. Um, and, of course, you just turn off hyper-threading, right? You didn't want that other CPU. We'll just turn off hyper-threading everywhere. So that's fine. Everybody happy with turning off hyper-threading? <sighs> so... Yeah, it means that hyperthreads running, siblings running different guests, that would be problematic. So we need co-scheduling um, or something. That's one potential answer, is to only ever run the same guest on both siblings, and then it can only see its own data, and that's generally considered to be more acceptable. Um, so we have posted um, patches. An insane number of it, something like 70 patches in that series to implement... Um, Co-scheduling, it is a complicated thing to do, um, but there is some quite severe motivation for doing it now, so we'll see how we get, um, whether we can get Peter to take it. Um, but even the patches we have at the moment are not entirely complete. Um, they work for our use case internally, um, but there are some things like load balancing which don't work, and some people quite like scheduler load balancing, so I'm not sure I understood fully, but you say a VM guest can read what its sibling is, uh, its sibling memory, but it needs to be at the kernel level to control its own page table. That's no. You do have to cause it, to be, you, it does have to be in the level one cache. Yeah. Okay. But it's really easy to trick the kernel into loading something into the level one cache. 
because any of those gadgets, you don't need a full Spectre V1 gadget with uh, loading the secret and then loading something offset by that secret. That's quite complex and relatively rare. All you need to do is do a load up from an array with an offset, right? Okay. And we've used that array index no spec to fix the relatively small number of full Spectre V1 gadgets, so, uh, but we haven't fixed everything in the kernel that loads with an offset. I think that what is not clear is that this attack it doesn't, doesn't, come, doesn't come from user space. It, you, you need to control a kernel in a guest. Yeah, yeah it, it's a guest. So it is the kernel in the guest, that's right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, you need to control the PGs. Yes. And it is slightly non-trivial for guest user spaces to do Just that. open dev KVM and you have a kernel that you can uh, <laughs> run in a guest, I mean. Yeah. The, yeah, the yeah, guest absolutely. kernel it, it is allows guests faster. to attack hypervisor. It's harder to do it from a user space process, although you can play with M unmapping things or making them go into swap. And there, there are possibly some tricks. I haven't seen a viable exploit that just includes user space, right? This is really a VM guest thing. Yeah, you we, just open the FKVM. Yeah, oh, absolutely. <laughs> um, so yes, code scheduling has been posted. It helps. Um, but it's not entirely sufficient because even if you're running the same guest twice on, you know, on both siblings, it can still make hypercalls and it can still basically switch into the host kernel and get the host kernel to access data for it because all it has to do is pull it into L1 cache. So um, maybe what you really want is to cause the VM exit on both siblings when one of them exits. Now, interestingly, Power 8 does this already. It's um, the, the equivalent of the EPT, the translation from guest physical to host physical addresses, only exists once per, per core group. Um, and so you can't have different siblings running different guests. And the way they do that is the host Linux kernel doesn't even see the siblings. They are only fired up to run the guest. And when one or more of the siblings does something that causes a VM exit, they all come out and get serviced. And that is a potential approach that can deal with L1TF for us. Um, but it's not exactly viable for those who just want to run a Windows VM on their laptop. But for those who are running hosting services that care about this kind of thing and can really co-schedule like that, yeah, that makes sense. If we don't care about the siblings in the host kernel, then that's potentially viable. So we're looking at that. Um, but another thing is, Another potential approach is we're calling it secret hiding, and essentially it's a little bit like the meltdown mitigation where we just take those pages away. They do not exist, they cannot be accessed. So mostly the kernel, when it's running in kernel space, in, in the meltdown case, has all the physical memory mapped. There's a one-to-one -one mapping of all physical memory always available via a kernel virtual address. And the meltdown mitigation was to take that away when user space is running, but it's still always present when you're in the kernel. Now, the L1TF secret hiding concept is basically to take that away as well. And so when you need to access physical pages that aren't otherwise mapped for, you know, for something through user space addresses, then you must explicitly map them. And we did this in the very old days of 32-bit machines and with four, more than four gig of memory, right? We, had, we could not physically, we, we could not fit more than a certain amount of memory into the virtual address space of a 32-bit machine. And so we already had the concept of having to map and unmap pages, and it was appallingly slow and horrible. Um, but that is another approach that we're looking at, um, starting with the most important things um, and we have patches that hide the register state of a given vCPU in a per process address, um, actually carved out of the process address space. Um, so that's one of the other mitigations we can use for L1TF, but it's basically early days yet. So we are looking at co-scheduling, we are looking at, yeah, Intel don't really have a better answer than turn off hyperthreading, and nobody's really going to do that in practice. So we're all kind of scrambling a little bit for what we can do in the long term that's going to make this viable. Um, 
So that's where we are today. We have the Repoline, um, and we do use IBRS in the kernel, but we only use it on calls into firmware. Um, if you're using EFI, that's going to be a mess of horrible um, over-engineered indirect function pointer calls. And so we do actually set the IBRS bit when the Linux kernel makes, an, makes any call into firmware. Um, we do the IPB, the full barrier on context switch, um, as I said, but we are still refining the details of which context switch we do that for. We don't do it most of the time. Um, we also flush the um, return stack buff buffer on context switch um, and VMX it in an attempt to deal with the Skylake problem. Um, but it's not sufficient because we can have call stacks deeper than 32. Um, and we can sometimes manage that without overflowing the kernel stack. So we have a partial mit mitigation for Skylake. Um, but yes, ma the major mitigation for Skylake is the last bullet point on the slide. Um, and yes, we, just as a defense in depth, uh, um, we clear all the registers on kernel entry, uh, other than the actual syscall arguments. Why bother letting people just put random arbitrary numbers into registers so that they can call some gadget and get it to do what they want? We just clear everything else. Likewise, we flush the, um, we flush the cache. Um, so we have a reasonable mitigation in Linux for most of the problems um, up to L1TF, and which we're still talking about. Um, Zen, we're doing slightly better. Um, we do use IBRS in Zen um, for Zen, or if, for, sorry, for Skylake, or if, there isn't, if we've built without a Redpoline um, compiler. Um, we'll always do the full flush on context switch between VMs, because it's a little bit more clear cut there um, than various different um, Linux user space context switches. We clear the RSB on VM exits. Um, and likewise, the defense in depth attack, uh, thing of just clearing the, um, clearing the GPRs. So Zen is somewhat better off um, in that respect. Um, Paolo has talked a little bit, a bit about what you can do in applications um, if you are sort of running jittered JavaScript code and otherwise uh, exposing yourself to attack. Um, you can't use the MSRs. They are only for the kernel. Um, but you can use the Repoline. You can build your own code with Repoline. Again, we don't want any of those nasty indirect branches in our code, and then they can't be. Um... And, the and yeah, absolutely. You, you end up needing to build quite a lot, the libraries and anything else that you're going to call into. Yep. Um, and that's fairly much where we are. So questions? Do you want to come back up, Paolo? Um, I, I think we have a fundamental problem here, which is that um, for several decades we started to trust the software a lot to, to share some resources between uh, different security domains. And in parallel, uh, the CPUs had to uh, constantly increase their, uh, their speed to address uh, new requirements which were not present at the time the operating systems were developed. And uh, the two are now colliding. And anyway, we still need to have the two, but not necessarily at the same place. Uh, there are, for example, people who just want to play the fastest possible games on their machine, and they won't care at all about all of this. Yep. Uh, I'm working in uh, load balancing uh, network appliances. Uh, I don't care at all about this either, because it destroys my performance. Yep. And uh, people like you run uh, virtualized environments uh, with uh, many, many customers who don't have to take the risk uh, to share anything with uh, someone else uh, would pro probably prefer to waste performance than take some risks. But conversely, the customers or you know, anybody who's running a single VM for a single purpose with no untrusted code in that, their kernel doesn't need to do any of this crap either, right? Yes, yeah. the hypervisor, oh God, yes, we care. But for an individual guest, we don't care. For a lot of these guests, no. you might as well be running UC Linux because it's all about the app. You've got one VM for one app and who mm. gives a crap about the kernel protecting it from anything else yeah. in that case, yeah. 
And I, I think that ultimately we will have to rethink all of this uh, to think how to uh, design a new CPUs to address this and possibly to have a knob to say I want to be secure, I want to be fast, or maybe to be between the two and say that we want to have, uh, we are willing to take the risk between a number of uh, context VMs or whatever within one security domain but not share anything and experience a huge cost when switching for example. But it will be difficult because right now a lot of resources are shared. I expect that we will see some issues with people detecting that some data are already loaded in memory because uh, the host system does not swap, for example, uh, when you access some data directly from RAM. We already have this issue in some uh, virtualized environments where if you have too high a connection rate, uh, you hit some limits due to the host running contract and you can even guess the, the contract size on the host. So probably we, you will be able to infer that other VMs are do, doing some traffic or that some backups are running or whatever. So uh, it's an endless problem if we don't try to attack the root instead of plugging holes. Yep. That's a simple solution. Testing providers don't need to use version protection. Just use containers. <laughs> it's a marketing point. I'd repeat it, but no, I'm not going to. Okay. <laughs> I have one mic on there. So hosting providers, just go with the hosting provider that only uses bare metal containers. You don't need any of this virtualization shit if you're just running an application. Yeah, and the kernel doesn't even, context, doesn't even flush the BTB between, yeah. you know, on context which is between containers then, right? So. Yeah, but you don't have the privilege to, to exploit L1TF. Right, okay. You, you can just use any other kernel vulnerability that is not patched or is zero day or what? It's not a meltdown or spectre uh, mitigation because they're problems for all processes. Yeah. Yeah. For L1TF, containers actually don't suffer from it, VMs do. Yeah, that's the exception. So, so containers, but not on Skylake. <laughs> well, even, even Skylake containers can't do L1TF, they can just do all the other spectre and meltdown yeah. problems. There are approaches for using L1TF from user space with crafty M maps and causing swap. But yeah, much, much harder. It's trivial from a, from a guest. And again, if the hosting provider lets you use DevKVM, you are, f you are giving virtualization to your customer even if you are not using it yourself. The device is secret, doesn't use DevKVM. Yeah, it depends on the provider. I don't think a service provider would give access to DevKVM in a container. Why not? <laughs> because <laughs> it's a whole new attack surface. Oh, well, I, I mean, it's not a privileged interface. Uh, on the contrary, DevKVM until L1TF is supposed to be usable by unprivileged users. If you ask the provider, if you pay enough, the provider, they will give you access to it, maybe? Okay. Well, not now. Not now, not anymore, but <laughs> <laughs> if you'd asked last month. <laughs> if you asked. <laughs> How much of this do you think we can say that's all behind us, you know, hardware mistakes of the past? <laughs> and how much of it do you think we're going to have to live with for years and years to come? Yeah, yeah I was going to say the same. Yeah. We are still finding issues, right? It's basically opened up a new seam to mine for vulnerabilities. There's a whole bunch of stuff that we haven't properly explored yet um, of other things that happen in speculation that just violate this original premise that it goes away and it never happened. Um, and people are looking at ways they can kind of restore the cash state and fetch back that cash line that got evicted so that nobody can tell, but that's kind of hard and I think it will keep coming. And Intel don't even have definitions for what a fixed CPU will look like for the current generation, right? So if you look at the IBRS definition, there is an upcoming enhanced IBRS um, which does some of the required tagging, and I think it 
tags with a privilege level, but not with the VMID and the PCID. So you still have to flush on context switch, although you don't have to flush on kernel entry, right? Um, and so Intel have defined this enhanced IBRS, and they had that from January. This is what it shall look like when we've fixed that much. But, but they haven't even defined the CPU ID bit that will tell us that it's completely fixed and we don't have to do the flush on context switch. They haven't even defined what that will look like, let alone actually fixed it. So is, is there a worry then that sort of software engineers will say, well, this is the hardware job to fix it, and the hardware guys will say, we gave you the pieces to, to mitigate it, and actually nothing happens? I don't think so. I think there are enough people whose livelihoods depend on this shit right. working. <laughs> um, but on the other hand, it, I mean, it, it's... Uh, you fix one and one comes, so chances are that at any given time you will have one that has just been fixed and one is just as bad. Maybe not just as bad, but also pretty bad. And not. It's interesting that the people are getting less interested. There was not a lot of interest in L1TF last month, despite it being kind of scarier in many you ways. Did, you didn't even mention the speculative store bypass because it's really boring. Sorry? The speculative store bypass isn't even in your slides, right? It's no, a that's seriously true. boring it's, one. It's absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I, I considered adding it, but I already had to make enough simplifications to fit everything in 40 minutes. I mean... Yeah, what, is that V5? Four, I V4, think. V4, yeah. They, we're up to five or six or something with... Yeah. Yes, there are a bunch. But you, like I said, there are lots of these, and people are still finding new ways to attack it. And it's not clear how they will fix that because it involves unwinding years of pipelining and stuff and the assumption that stuff can be torn down without side effect. It, it's going to be complicated, but I think they're going to have to do it. I do. There's only so much you can do in software. So the, the interesting thing to me is that uh, some choices like the split uh, user and kernel space uh, page tables were more or less abandoned because they were considered un unnecessary complications and they are probably coming back. Uh, hi, great presentation. Um, maybe a metaphysical question. When you look into GPUs, you see exactly the opposite. You see systems that are simple, that goes very fast, that doesn't, they don't even manage the cast by themselves. You need to programmatically define how the cast is fed uh, most of the time. And because they don't have to do all this, they can have amazing parallel uh, properties. Is there any movement in the silicon uh, market to generate CPUs that are dumb, that doesn't have executa execu speculative uh, anything, and just rely on powerful uh, compilers to do this? And because well, there was Titanic. <laughs> <laughs> That's something new and <laughs> useful. <laughs> Because we are just, in two more months, we are going to have another thing. And in one more year, we are going to have another thing with this. GPUs, <sighs> GPUs make me sad. GPUs are designed to go fast, and nobody cares when they crash, right? They don't work for multi-tenant. They just, well, mostly they don't work, right? I mean, we still have people putting the registers you need to flash the firmware of a card in the same 4K space that we need to give to guests who actually want to use that card. Using GPUs in a multi-tenant environment is just painful, right? And it's always, they're always designed on the basis that it doesn't matter if they crash, it doesn't matter if it, and when they crash, it doesn't matter if it takes your whole box down by taking out the PCI bus, because who cares, your game has crashed anyway, so why would you care? And GPUs are not something I would hold up as an example for how we might want them to go forward in many ways. Uh, yeah. In the current form, yes, you're absolutely right. But if we design a CPU that is completely stupid and give us a thousand threads... You get the itanium. Or, like, you get the cost between the Xeon Phi and the itanium. With the disadvantages of both. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I mean, one, one way to avoid all the need for this is to have massively parallel, have loads and loads of threads. We, we won't make it go faster, we'll just give you more of them. But people aren't very good at writing code that, that way. And compilers aren't very good at generating code that way, even though they help a bit more than they used to. Um, 
lots of people just want it fast, and that's harder. So it's what Will said yesterday. People want performance. They don't want concurrency. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have a question. Like, do, don't you think like the hardware is completely useless today to, for the features that we need to have? Because it's like uh, Intel maybe need, or whatever uh, founder, need to review how to do uh, hardware to basically all the requirements we have in software with isolation of the process in kernel, user space, KVM, etc. We have multiple levels today. And um, like for a kind of ID feature didn't exist today, would we like to flush the cache or have a, a cache index uh, based on the context switch, uh, hardware context switch? So we will be isolating completely the software, the hardware uh, context, really, physically, uh, even the cache line will be only from one context switch. So one context switch could be the kernel and others multiple levels. So communication will be the shared memory based on a uh, shared page cache or shared page on the TLB. And it should be uh, a big fix and a big advance in the computing or CPU maintenance. So, um, in the founders. Um, so, yeah, I'll restart to my first question. Do you think that um, uh, CPU founder should uh, do something today to have a, a feature support that we have in software? Well, most likely. Uh, I'm, not sh I'm not quite sure I answered the question. Okay. Yeah. Um, most likely. Do you think that the hardware should um, fit what the requ we have, uh, requirements that we have in software? Oh, absolutely, yeah. All this software should go away. The hardware should fix it. Mm. Extending the cache and having cache partitioning, well, that's nice if you can suddenly put much more cache on the die. What percentage of a die these days is, is cache? Yeah, 80? a lot. Um, it's yeah. hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? You, you can't just put more cache on. But there are tricks. And yes, tagging the cache and having some way to... Avoid yeah, obviously the, the cost related, like the founder will reply, it costs a lot of money, but meanwhile, we will avoid all these uh, tricks, software tricks, uh, to bypass the hardware uh, limitation, uh, to bypass uh, software limitations that we want to isolate, but we can't, because by the hardware, like Rohammer as well, Rohammer is like a physics uh, attack on the RAM, um, uh, but it's always a, a kind of... Um, Limitation between the software and the hardware, but uh, we, uh, how we can push the hardware uh, people, the founder, to to introduce uh, good feature and not just uh, I did a flag to say we have some limitation. Uh, I disable <laughs> the hyper threading because uh, you have we, we can attack with do side def side uh, side effect attack. Um, yeah, no, we, we should absolutely push the hardware vendors to fix this. Yeah. They, we've got to work around it in software as much as we can until they can fix it. And I understand why the new Intel CPUs haven't been fixed yet, why we only have the yeah, partial yeah, no, enhanced IBRS. You can't just stop the fabs for two years and go back to the drawing board. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, they shoehorned what tagging they could get in, and they need to keep going. Yes, it need, this needs to be fixed in hardware. We need to be able to look back at this as a bad memory and... Oh, yeah, yeah. but design, uh, not the design that we need today. The software part, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, will, uh, just here. Uh, will there also be some uh, way to disable the mitigation? So for example, currently we have uh, the boot command line, no IBPS, no IBRS, and stuff like that. Yes. But you can, uh, there is some modification that cannot be turned off. And f in my case, like Willie said, uh, we have some workload that just doesn't care about security. We are in an enclosed environment. We just want uh, the whole workload to go fast, to have IOs, to, uh, just to use the, the hardware we are paying for. So everything can be disabled except for the Spectre V1 uh, array index no spec, and that doesn't have any performance impact. I mean, it's in the noise. It's like <laughs> there are like a thousand uh, such accesses in the whole kernel, including all the drivers, and uh, they pay a price of one instruction per access, so two instructions per access. And that's even the Repolene. Even if you build the kernel with a Repolene compiler, We've made that so instead of inlining those repoline thunks into the code, it simply loads the target into a register and jumps to a thunk that we provide in the kernel. 
And if you're running without or on an unaffected machine or if you've explicitly turned it off, that just turns into a straight um, direct, yeah. I mean indirect, yeah, no, an unconditional branch, and those are hard to predict. So those are hard. It depends the results between the different person that runs the benchmark. Some are reporting 5% uh, loss of performance. Some, some ones are reporting 30%. 5% with everything turned off? Uh, depends on the, on the workload. If he's doing a lot of IOs, a lot of uh, memory access. Uh, I, the, the benchmark results really depends on who's running it. But that's for the, the ones we are currently, uh, for the, the patches that are currently uh, available, but for the next one, for the next CPU, the next generation, if we, uh, if you ask the hardware vendors to fix it in the silicon, then we all know they are not very keen on releasing their firmware or, or different uh, exact details on what they fixed. So, so whatever could be fixed in the firmware has been released, but there are some changes that you just cannot do in the firmware because you need more bits. Yeah. Mm just the transistors are not there. If you can find significant slowdowns when everything is turned off, we should look at that. Let me know, because we've designed it to all alternative away when it's not needed. Because we've always had this end game in mind, this stuff needs to go away, right? It needs to be a bad memory. And we want kernels booted, built today to be able to just turn it off. And that's one of the reasons we are pushing on Intel for the fact that they haven't actually defined the CPU ID bit that um, tells us it's gone away, yeah? Um, but if you turn off Retpolines, you know, as Paolo says, you should basically have only the array index no spec masking, and that should be f essentially free. That shouldn't cost. But prove me wrong and we'll have a look at fixing it. And uh, some of the optimization that he mentioned uh, around inlining, they actually provide a speed up even if red pollen is disabled. Just smaller speed up, but it's still a speed up. Yep. And um, I, I would like to, to stress that uh, it's probably time that we uh, teach uh, basic architecture again to developers because for uh, all over the last decade, we have been lying to them, say, saying, just trust uh, this hardware, just trust uh, this framework, etc., without thinking. And in fact, uh, all side channel attacks have been present everywhere, including without any help from the hardware. Uh, we talked uh, yesterday uh, about uh, crypto, for example. It's well known in this area. Uh, we know that uh, we can infer certain things due to hash collisions. I remember uh, maybe 15 years ago, I was able to check on my system if a password was valid or not, uh, just by timing the, to the time it took uh, to run a login or sudo or something like this. Um, and uh, now we are forced to have caches everywhere. It's absolutely mandatory due to the memory access time and whatever storage access time. And caches by design are shared between multiple consumers, otherwise they are almost pointless. But if multiple consumers share the same cache, it is mandatory that uh, the impact of one consumer will be measurable by the other one. So there is, in my opinion, no alternative except to uh, explain to developers what is the impact of loading some data uh, in memory, to use it in memory, and we need to provide them with some means to cancel these effects when they know that there could be a consequence. The hardware needs to help on this. For example, uh, we need possibly to be able to flush uh, the cache for a whole memory area uh, without, without having any privilege or whatever, we possibly need to have such things, but we need to teach the developers how to use them as well. Good luck with that. I know. <laughs> I know, but... I don't think it's... Uh, yeah, I, I, I'd like to agree, but I just don't think it's viable. I don't think we can teach people to... I don't think we can get people to care, let alone actually understand. So, uh, it's uh, too uh, hard. I know, but at least... Today, some people care, and it's difficult for them because probably they are missing some of the tools required to do this correctly. Or they might want to use libraries. <laughs> yes, as well. Yes. As well. Yeah. yeah, that's true. We're over time, aren't we? Yeah. Cool. Uh, 
we we've seen in the recent months that uh, the software communities were tr rushing trying to fix uh, vulnerabilities in hardware whether it's the linux community or windows people apple people uh, at one point uh, they are trying to come with clever tricks and that we everybody knows it has to be fixed in hardware uh, it it i think it doesn't only need to be fixed in hardware but design uh, hardware design needs to change at some point and uh, hardware manufacturers aren't really um, uh, well s at least for intel i guess it's for, for other two performance is uh, the priority uh, because it's how they sell cpus uh, but at some point uh, software people um, uh, know how well they have to use the cpus and they have to use the features provided by the cpu maybe at some point uh, hardware manufacturers need to more rely on software people uh, well and i know uh, intel and harm and uh, they have a lot of software engineer in house but i'm not sure how much they are uh, um, actually uh, helping designing uh, cpus uh, Intel loves to add features, but not really to remove them. Um, so Intel did a thing every year. They used to call it Tech Days, and they got Linus and a bunch of other people into a room with the architects, and Linus got to shout at people. And it was very effective, and we got some things done that way. Um, <coughs> and it would be good to see everybody doing that kind of thing. Um, Yes, we do have that kind of feedback from the OS developers to chip designers, and it's a useful thing to have. But yes, perhaps some more of it. But yeah, nobody realized this was a problem, right? It, it's just, oh shit. Well, so do this. We've had tech days for 10 years. I've been telling the Intel people that we need CR3 tagging of the TLB, which would have prevented, I didn't know it would prevent meltdown, but it would have done, and they refused to do it for 10 years. So we have asked for features continuously that would have fixed some of these problems. Yeah, no, we don't get everything we ask for, but we do get some things. Um. Thank you.